Hi and welcome to Showcase, broadcasting to you from our studios in Istanbul. Today we'll take a look at two productions with one thing in common. Both are set in the American West and both deal with the portrayal of Native Americans. We'll speak to an expert on how Hollywood is finally coming to terms with and rewriting its past wrongs when it comes to showing stereotypes on the big screen. But first... Dropping down the digital rabbit hole. No, it's not Alice's Wonderland, but later in the show, we'll take you there. It could potentially offer like a modular fashion system where everything could be reassembled and sort of like customized and personalized. Reimagining the runway as students from London's Royal College of Art literally use blood, sweat and tears in their designs. Fashion has come a long way from uncomfortable waist-pinching corsets, fur-trimmed cloaks and beehive hairdos. But alongside the evolution of style has come a revolution in the way many designers and consumers think of the materials used to make what we wear. And the group of fashion students you're about to see are no exception. London's Royal College of Art has just put the spotlight on extraordinary and highly environmental fashion designs that push boundaries. The annual show witnessed unique ideas, including one from an innovative graduate showcasing a pair of ballet shoes adorned with crystals formed from sweat. Alice Potts, who kept her crystallization process under wraps, has also experimented with blood. I think there's so many applications for it, like so far I think even in the future if it was created in something like a biosensor, so something that could detect things for like um, high sugar level, for diabetes, for health reasons, but also this whole new way of how we can grow accessories, so instead of using plastic accessories to maybe embellish garments, but how we can start like growing onto our garments these new materials and the more natural materials. Another futuristic design was from another graduate. His idea is that by mounting a camera behind and above your head, you can get a third-person view of yourself through VR goggles, as if you're in a video game. Um, Abyss Vision is a third-person view live stream to your headset. So it puts you um, just a few uh, feet behind your head, and I call it uncanny reality because everything is the same but not quite right. There was also a new weaving technique aimed at reducing fashion waste and challenging overconsumption. So because my garment, everything is not uh, sewn down, so it could potentially offer like a modular fashion system where everything could be reassembled and sort of like customized and personalized. Um, if you buy like different patterns, like sleeves, colors, you can go home and then like change the bit that you already have with the interweaving technique that I have and a space travel friendly garment just seemed to confirm that this year's fashion event was simply out of this world. A lot of people are understandably wary when it comes to the idea of artificial intelligence. The thought that machines are being developed to mimic human behavior and thinking is a concept a lot of people want to pretend doesn't exist. But what if AI could be harnessed to turn tired and dull museums into colorful, immersive spaces? Let's find out. Tokyo's Mori Building Digital Art Museum presents Borderless, a digital exhibition displaying more than 50 multimedia artworks. This three-dimensional art gallery offers an opportunity to become one with the art. The artificial intelligence makes everything realistic. With the added sounds and sensory effects, Visitors feel like they've stepped into a magical world. 
Kokuto. This is a borderless world that changes over time. It changes after five minutes. Next month, it will be different. And the month after that, it will be an entirely different world. The presence of people who come to the exhibition will also make a change in this world. People who visit can experience something new. The experience is highlighted by the fact that the AI extends the artwork through the hallways in a way where they overlap each other. That's why it's called borderless art. The slightest touch of a ball could trigger a change in color, or a flower may suddenly grow out from the ground. And for art lovers, it's an enchanting experience. It is just so beautiful and time appropriate. The multimedia changes, so it's a lot of fun. You never get bored. I think it is so mysterious, and it feels as if I entered another world. I'm super impressed. I was like, um, I've been to the thing where the, like, like the raindrops. I mean, and I was like, oh my gosh, I've never seen something like this. It's like super impressive. Organizers say they've tried to build an environment of cultural interaction for Japan's art scene. And although there is not a fixed date for the closing, visitors need to hurry up. Tickets for the colorful exhibition have been selling fast. Still to come on Showcase, rewriting past wrongs. You're not good at keeping still, are you? Shoot me, then I will be still. What would be the point of shooting you? A new period drama looks at the plight of Native Americans in the 19th century in an entirely new light. Don't act like the man from the stories I've heard. That's the thing about being a grandfather. Back home on the range, actor Kevin Costner returns to television after a five-year hiatus. Detective Inspector Oscar Mills. Hiding in the shadows, actor Natalie Dormer makes her dark debut as a writer-producer with a new Hitchcockian thriller. But let's first take a look at some other stories that caught our eye, beginning with an issue we've regularly covered here on Showcase, repatriating priceless antiquities. Hundreds of recently recovered artifacts have gone on display at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Italy returned the artifacts last May after police confiscated them from a group of smugglers. Almost 200 antiquities and more than 20,000 coins were retrieved, all of which date back to the Polymaic and Islamic periods. The Louvre Museum is now offering visitors a chance to learn about the artworks featured in Jay-Z and Beyoncé's latest music video. The 90-minute guided tour features the 17 paintings and sculptures highlighted in the video. Among them are of course the Mona Lisa and the Venus de Milo. The international non-profit organization Reporters Without Borders has released its annual photo album for 2018. 100 photos for the freedom of the press features some of the most well-known works by mysterious French photographer and street artist J.R. The photo album is now on sale worldwide. Legendary rock band The Rolling Stones has announced an expansive worldwide partnership with Universal Music Group. The new deal covers the band's recorded music, audiovisual catalogs, and global merchandising of its famous tongue logo. The deal also covers the band's expansion into areas of art, fashion, and sport. Almost since its creation, Hollywood has come under fire for its portrayal of non-Caucasians, and many would say the one group that suffered the most when it comes to negative stereotypes on screen are Native Americans. But a recent production starring multiple Academy Award nominee Jessica Chastain is looking to rewrite that narrative. And it's causing quite a stir. Let's take a look and see why. 
Movies exploring the open American frontier often pit the settler community against the original landowners, the Native Americans who are often portrayed as a threat. What about Indians? Through the years, this representation has transformed, but not for the better. More recent Tinseltown motion pictures feature the natives as a backward culture in need of enlightenment. For a brief period during the counterculture movement of the 1970s, American filmmakers did try to explore the atrocities committed by the settlers, but it was short-lived. Forgive me, ma'am, but uh, very few unaccompanied ladies travel beyond no more. Then they are missing some rare beauty. You're not a soldier's wife. No, I'm a painter. Now a new film featuring Golden Globe winner Jessica Chaston once again aims to take an introspective step. Woman Walks Ahead finds the veteran actor playing an artist who wants to paint the portrait of a Sioux chief. Media outlets have praised the flick for the strong performances of its actors. And while some have critiqued the film's white saviour theme, others have argued that it speaks on behalf of the settlers who were against the injustices committed against Native Americans. Then I will be still. What would be the point of shooting you? They tracked down every chief who killed them all. Except for you. The only battle I ever fought against is insignificance. Children are being taken away from their parents right now. And, um... I can't talk about that without crying. I get so emotional about that. But, I mean, that happened in your family, yeah. you know? Um, so it's not a new thing that's happened in the United States. It's really woven into the fabric of what this nation was built on. Yeah. Our communities were gutted when uh, children were taken. And I'm from Canada, and, and that same history played out. So when I, when I look at the headlines, I see an all-too-familiar history playing out before us. He looked so magnificent. This do not give him reason to hope. And the talent featured in Woman Walks Ahead believes the subject matter of their movie is still relevant today in the wake of the US's controversial refugee regulations. Woman Walks Ahead wrapped up production in 2017, and critics say it's no coincidence that the movie got a wide release at a time when racial political tension in the US was and perhaps still is on the rise. And deep down, that's what the bull wants too. Now terrible things have happened here in the past. I'm just here to paint a painting. Later in the show, we'll take a look at Yellowstone, a new TV series that touches on subject matter similar to Women Walks Ahead. But first, let's speak with Mary Stuckey. She's a professor of communication arts and sciences who specializes in American Indian politics. Thank you so much for coming on our show today, Mary. Now, let's begin by first talking about the difference between how indigenous uh, men are represented uh, compared to how indigenous women are re represented on screen. So men tend to come in one of two flavors. Uh, they tend to be portrayed either as savages or as noble. Uh, when they are savages, they tend to be victimizers. When they are noble, they tend to be victims. Women, on the other hand, are almost always portrayed as pure Indian maidens, and they are often exploited by white people. So what are some examples of uh, productions you think did a particular disservice to Native Americans? Well, anything before the 1980s or 1990s, the most notorious films are things like John Wayne movies in general, uh, particularly The Searchers. There's a film called, I think, Cheyenne Autumn that is famous in Indian country for its uh, negative depictions of Indians and is often made fun of. Um, around uh, later, like, sort of after the Red Power Movement, um, movies got a little bit better. So you get things like Little Big Man, you get Kevin Costner's uh, depiction of Indians in Dances with Wolves, which is one of the few and earliest movies in which um, American Indians actually portrayed American Indians as opposed to white people uh, dressing up like Indians. And Pocahontas was also uh, a production that caused a bit of controversy as well, wasn't it? Um, indeed it was. Uh, Russell Means, who was a very famous Indian activist, also argued that that was one of the best portrayals of American Indians ever made. Uh, a lot of American Indians disagreed with that characterization. Mm -hmm. 
Now, in what ways do these often negative fictional representations affect people's real lives? So it's a question of um, accumulated weight, I think is the best way to think about this. So what happens is if you get one negative stereotype, it doesn't matter very much. But when all of the depictions of you or your group are negative or wrong, then the weight of that starts to bear on you quite a lot. Um, I know Indian children, for instance, who have been um, made fun of because they have long hair, people treat them as if they're dirty, as if they're savages. Um, and these are children. They don't, they don't need that, but they also never get over it. Is there a financial impact as well? Uh, sure, because if you think of a group as stupid or as ignorant or as untrainable, it's less likely to employ them. Um, certainly life on an Indian reservation is difficult at best. All right. Now, there's also this misconception of thinking that all Native Americans are alike and there is no variation in their cultures and history, isn't there? Uh, there is that misconception, um, as if all American Indians live in teepees. Uh, there are 500 plus different Indian nations in the United States alone. Uh, and there are a variety of cultures, of languages, of connections to other indigenous people. Um, yes, there's a great deal of variety among Indian people. And many of them um, also live in on reservations. Many of them live in cities. Um, many of them drive pickup trucks, they drive Porsches. They are not all the same person. Tell me why Dances with the Wolves was such a successful and popular uh, production. So successful and popular doesn't necessarily mean that it was also um, good. Uh, in general, when members of a hegemonic or settler culture make movies about the indigenous people that were there before them, uh, the perspective you're gonna get is that of the indigenous, or of the settler nation, not of the indigenous people. So one of the nice things about Dances with Wolves is that it actually treated American Indians as if they had viable cultures and histories and traditions that were worth um, respecting and even emulating. Uh, but fundamentally, that movie remains about the white guy, not about the Indian people. So are there any good representations of Native Americans in pop culture that you can cite? Oh, sure. Um, and in general, if you want to see good movies about indigenous people, you should look at the movies, read the novels, see the art that's produced by those people. So for movies, for instance, You've got Geronimo, an American legend, um, Smoke Signals, uh, The Fast Runner, which is about the Aleut, uh, a movie called Skins. There's one called Imprint. Um, there's one called Dance Me Outside uh, that's quite good. Uh, and so I think that in general, if you look to the movies produced by the people concerned, you're going to get better, more rich and more accurate depictions of them than if you look at uh, movies produced by people from outside that culture. Well, Mary, why do you think it's so crucial uh, and important to have uh, productions like the one you just listed made? Because we live in a world in which we have vast misconceptions about other people, other groups, other cultures, and the more accurate our information uh, and the, the greater our understanding of those cultures. Well, Mary, thank you so much for giving us that insight and coming on our show today. Thank you very much for having me. Over the course of decades, films have mythified the American West in almost every possible way. And it could be the reason why productions with a Western flavor have fallen out of favor with some audiences. But a new television series promises it's breaking new ground with a never-before-tried narrative, and it's recruited a big-name star who also happens to be familiar with the genre. It says here that you've been decorated, and they sent you here to be posted. Actually, sir, I'm here at my own request. Why? I've always wanted to see the frontier. You want to see the frontier? Yes, sir. Before it's gone. After receiving critical acclaim for parts in cult films, actor Kevin Costner's global breakthrough came with his Oscar-winning performance in the American Civil War drama, Dances with Wolves. 
Throughout his career, Costner reinforced his star persona as the idealist Western hero with the roles he chose to play. The veteran actor shifted gears in the 21st century and carried his screen image to television. His role as a patriarch stuck in a blood feud between succession states during the American Civil War landed him an Emmy for Outstanding Lead Acting. It's your cowboy today. You don't act like the man from the stories I've heard. That's the thing about being a grandfather. Now, after five years, Costner returns to the small screen once again with a modern Western tale. Yellowstone is about a rancher family that faces constant problems from land developers and neighboring farms. And it has been given the thumbs up for bringing a realistic and intense look at the mythology of US's open frontier. This ain't checker, son. The showrunners say the series will deal with the non-sugar-coated side of Americana. All I do every day. It's a continuation on a theme. I think that uh, I think you know, there's a lot uh, to explore in the American West. I think that it's look, it's a genre that they've been making movies about for you know, since they've been making movies. And, and, uh, it's a uniquely American place, and the lifestyles that people live there are uniquely American. And so it's a great way to examine ourselves. Stagnation is death for a town, and the Duttons are the ones killing it. Costner, who plays the lead character that controls the largest contiguous ranch in America, assures audiences that the show's storyline will keep them at the edge of their seat. I don't regret one cent I've committed. It surprised me and entertained me. Those are always pretty good prerequisites for choosing a story to do. Does it surprise you? You know, it, you know, is it you know go in a direction that you, you just don't see things coming? I mean, in life, I want to be surprised, just like anybody. I mean, all of us get into a, a routine, if you will, about doing something, and I can't say any of us aren't, you know, that good feeling about being pleasantly surprised. So far, Yellowstone has received mixed reviews. Some viewers have said that the show's highly melodramatic nature makes it hard to take it seriously. As we just saw, both Kevin Costner and Jessica Chastain used their star personas to tell a story of the American West in a way that hasn't been done before. On the same token, Actor Natalie Dormer used her star status to produce an independent film, which probably would have been overlooked by big studios. The Game of Thrones alumni recently produced, co-wrote, and starred in what could be described as a love letter to the suspense movies of the 1940s. After starring in the successful TV show The Tudors and hit silver screen franchise The Hunger Games, actor Natalie Dormer became a household name among pop culture fans. And recently the British performer got to work with her Hollywood director fiancé Anthony Byrne in In Darkness. So you didn't hear anything. The intriguing thriller, done in the style of old film noirs, tells the tale of a blind musician who overhears a murder being committed in her apartment block. In addition to her lead role, Dormer worked alongside Byrne co-writing and producing the film. And it's apparent that this project allowed the drama graduate to channel the avid cinephile in her. It was a sort of a love letter to all the sort of psychological thrillers that we enjoyed watching as a couple. So it's Hitchcock, it's Marnie, Rear Window, um, Vertigo, and then all those film noirs from the 40s. Um, and then, you know, later psychological thrillers that we enjoyed, modern psychological thrillers that we enjoyed watching together. But then to play sort of a three-dimensional, fleshed-out anti-heroine is probably an easiest w way to explain her. Due to the workings of the movie industry, the veteran entertainer had to wait almost a decade to finally usher her dream project into theaters. Are you okay? I didn't have the bankability, darling. I wasn't famous enough to, you know, finance an independent movie uh, in 2009, uh, or a very, very cheap, not a movie that Anthony would have wanted to make. He wanted a, he wanted a bigger budget. So, um, and you know, that's the, rea that's the reality of independent filmmaking. So um, it was a joy the day 
that, um, you know, Anthony and the producers turned around to me and went, no, you, you can be Sophia now. There's a woman in the end of my arm. She's blind. The motion picture has received praise from media outlets and been described by some critics as an ambitious Hitchcock tribute that bites off more than it can chew. I'm being followed. And with that, we wrap up another episode of Showcase. You can head to our YouTube channel for more. And we'll be back tomorrow with more great stories from the global art scene. I'm Efnan Han. Bye for now.